This is the EFL Magazine Business Podcast number one. Today's guest is Ian Simpson, the owner of three ELT schools in Mie, Japan. Ian is also a surfer and rugby coach. Ian talks about setting up his business, his business story and what he's learned along the way. I very much enjoyed talking to Ian and I hope you'll enjoy listening too. Hey everyone, buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit eflmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, Here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Hello, everybody. Uh, Welcome to the first ever um, EFL Magazine business podcast. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Ian Simpson to you. Ian, how are you today? I'm very good. Thank you, Philip. And thank you for inviting me on to your very first show. I, I I couldn't I couldn't think of a better person to start with than than you, Ian, because you know you're a, a seasoned podcaster. So besides your schoolwork, which we'll we'll get into, and your entrepreneurship, uh, tell me a little bit about your podcasting. You have a few podcasts on the go. Is that... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the last time we spoke, we were on the other sides of the table. I think when we I was interviewing you for. Uh, I, I had a podcast called Tokyo Real Podcast, which was uh, educationally based and entrepreneur based in the beginning. And that sort of uh, morphed into um, the active podcast, which was a more, more general type of podcast to do with education and um, high performance sporting people. So that's still running. Then I've got a coffee and chat English podcast where there's 48 uh, topics uploaded. Um, each one lasts about 15 minutes and I talk about the topic and there's they, people can download um, related uh, worksheets to go with it and use in their classes. So that's pretty cool. And then um, my new baby is the Big Wave Surfing Podcast, where I interview a lot of the top big wave surfers in the world and dive deep into their consciousness and their minds and find out what makes them tick and how they survive in 80 foot waves. So um, yeah, those are the three podcasts I have running at the moment. Wow, you're a busy man. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, as you say, a labor of love. It's <laughs> it's good. It's good fun, and uh, it's nice talking to these people. You know, every time you talk to somebody, you you learn something new. That's the great thing about podcast. Actually, on the subject of podcasts, podcasts as as a business tool. Well, it depends. You know how what what your what your purpose for doing it for doing it for is for example um if you most people just started start off because they want they want they, you know they enjoy doing it and they want to talk about a particular topic or whatever um and that's what happened with my big wave surfing podcast i started off just doing it for the love of it and then um a company approached me uh, um blue soup equipment company they they sell these inflation up vests for, for big wave surfers and said, well, you, you, you have direct contact to all the big wave surfers, so can we sponsor you? So I, I got a sponsor like that. So straight away, I sort of monetized the podcast and, um, and that was stage one. Now, that's the simple way of doing it is to bring on sponsors um, who pay money or give products um, in order to monetize the product to pay for it. And that's the way people normally do it. And the, the extension of that is, is the, how I started the Tokyo Real podcast that came from London Real. And London Real started off as a podcast and then they, they evolved it into having like um, a business accelerator course and a, a mastermind class and uh, all kinds of add-ons that people paid for. So it, it, it became... Um, like a business accelerator or educational accelerator platform, um, which evolved from the podcast with all these add-ons that people paid extra for. So that's a way that you can sort of uh, uh, create create and develop the podcast if you wanted to. 
Okay, and and a podcast for students. Can you tell yeah, me well, the way, bit about the way that? I work that the, po- the podcast itself is free, so it's on Apple and Spotify, Stitcher, and the main platforms. Plus, it's on my web on my website, and that's all free. Um, and then on the podcast, I advertise if you want if you want the the, the forty eight um, topics booklet to go with the podcast, which is all prepared with the vocabulary and all the questions and the pictures. Just go to this link, pay uh, uh, nine ninety nine US dollars, and download it, and uh-huh. you, can, you know do what you want with it. So I give the I give the podcast free, and then sell products off the podcast. Oh, I see. And mm-hmm. can can you give me the link there? In can you? I we'll uh, put it in the show notes. There you go. There's some. Um, I'm being very podcasty already. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So please. Uh- yeah, I'll send it. I'll send you the links later. Actually, it's it's, it's the website is activeenglishnow.com, but I'll send you the links later. Perhaps you can put them in. I'd be grateful. Yeah, yeah def- definitely, definitely will. Okay, so um, so let's just go back a little bit about you, Ian. Um, tell me how long have you been? Li- you're living in Japan now. For uh, I, I've not given any background to you, but where are you living? Where are you from originally? How did you get to Japan? Yeah. 20 years in Japan now. Um, mm-hmm. So let me take you back to the, to the beginning. Um, I was born near London mm-hmm. uh, in a place called Reading. Uh, mm-hmm. Moved to Wales when I was nine and grew up in a beautiful place, Swansea, on the mm-hmm. Gower Peninsula, which was one of the um, first, it was the first place of to be designated uh, a place of outstanding natural beauty in, uh, in the country. So I grew up on the Gower in Wales and started surfing went to university in Cardiff University in Wales, um, which was a specialist physical education university. And then on the day I left university, I got a job teaching physical education in a high school in Wales, stayed there for 17 years as a high school teacher. And then I, towards the end of that time, I started coaching semi-professional rugby because I played rugby all my life since nine years old. And, um, and then I started, rugby was becoming, had just turned professional and there were opportunities in Japan to come here and coach rugby for big money because rugby in Japan was always professional because it was company based. So you had the company workers earning a salary who played for the company team. So basically they were getting paid to play rugby. They didn't do much work in the factory. They mainly played rugby, but they were employed by the company. So it was always professional. So they had money. So my mate who was here said, hey, why don't you come over to Japan um, and, uh, and coach professional rugby? Because I was well qualified uh, to do that. And uh, I was a bit burned out after almost 20 years of being a high school teacher in the UK. I, at some point, I, I, you know, I felt like I was more like a policeman. It was a tough school. I was in a, some, a tough high school in the Welsh Valleys. So um, I was burned out. I thought, yeah. You know, a few things happened in my private life, and then I was burned. I thought, time to get on a plane and go and do something different. And I ended up in Japan as a professional rugby coach initially. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, uh, how long did you? Um, how long were you a professional rugby coach, and how did you get into you know English language teaching? Yeah, about the first five years, um, I was coaching. Uh, um, started off in Tokyo at Aoyama Gakuin Daigaku. Oh, okay, and then. Um, mm. And I, then I was doing some work with Honda, Honda Heat down, mm-hmm. down here. I was moving around a lot, like what they call a spot coach, moving around a lot, coaching in different places. Um, and then I ended up in Honda, which is Suzuka, which is Mie, mm-hmm. and based myself down here. But what happened was, it's a bit like being a, you know, like a professional soccer, soccer manager. You know, you have a, a good few years, two or three years, and then... If the results start going wrong, they normally fire the manager, or or they, they they have a clean out. A new a new a new boss comes in and he has a clean out, gets new players in, gets new coaches, and that's the way it is. It's a sort of cycle. So you end up moving all around the country. And I I found a nice Japanese lady, got married, and the kids were coming. So I thought I don't want to do this anymore. So I thought, well, let's go back to what I I you know I've always done education and uh, open an English school because I looked at the people who were running English schools around me and thought well actually they they have no qualifications they're just foreigners who've ended up in japan and can't do anything else and open an so i'm sure I, i'm damn sure i can do it better than them so that's why i started to open an english school 
the rugby became more like part time locally. And the English school um, started to, I, I developed that and grew that from that point on so I could stay with the family. Okay. So your, your background, you're, you're, as, as you say, you were 17 years a PE teacher. I mean, that's, uh, did that prepare you for entrepreneurship? Did you always have a kind of an entrepreneurial sense bug or, um, I mean, where did that come from? I always had the entrepreneurial spirit, but to answer mm. your question, no. <laughs> <laughs> because once I started uh, an English school here in Japan, I realized that I knew nothing about business. Mm. I was a teacher. Mm. And, and that was the biggest shock to me, probably, that um, I, I now had to run a business as well as teach. And I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't prepared for it. And that's when I started doing a lot of self-study and uh, um, reading a lot of books. And I, I, my first school was in collaboration with a Juku, and they invited me to use the second floor and open an Aikawa school. So luckily, I they had experience in Japanese business, mm. uh, in the educational business in particular, of course. And so I, I got a lot of advice and learned a lot from them, them in the first few years. Um, and... Uh, steadily um, learned more and more about doing business in Japan but it was a long process and I'm still learning every day now mm -hmm. and um, the process came so was it a, su a sudden flash of inspiration say okay I want to start a business uh, and then you say okay what's the first step well Sorry. the way it worked for me was mm -hmm. I, I in that transitional period I was working in a, a junior high school in Japan and um like most teachers will know, you only have about two or three lessons a day, but they make you stay there from uh, 8.30 in the morning till five mm. o'clock at night. So I had a lot of downtime. So I spent a lot of that downtime studying Japanese. And then I decided, oh, I'm going to open my own school. So for about six months, I just sat at my desk when I wasn't teaching and planned every single detail of how I was going to start the school organize the school, run the school. I visualized what it was going to look like. I started a study about what my um, competitive advantage would be, about strategy. So I had about six months to plan it in detail before I even opened it. And I think that was a massive benefit to have thought it through thoroughly before actually opening the doors. So it sounds like your rugby coaching really came into play. Yeah, because, yeah, methodical and, um, you know, breaking it down into components and <laughs> units. So, yeah, um, I mean, having always been a teacher, that's the way I think analytically. Uh, in the rugby field, I was um, an analyst primarily. So I, I developed a lot of analytical systems for, for live analysis in, uh, in rugby, one of the pioneers of that, um, which I've actually brought into education of. I'll talk to you more about that later and sure. um, uh, so yeah I had that sort of uh, an analytical brain uh, mm. where I, I, mean, I guess I, I'm not I'm not very smart so I need to make things simple for myself <laughs> I need to I need to compart compartmentalize them and make them simple so I can see how see them very clearly because mm -hmm. um, that's the way I've always worked uh, so that's what I did yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and what was the driving force? So you, you wanted to become an entrepreneur. You wanted to start something. Um, so so what's what's the motivation to? The motivation mm. for me was um, I don't take orders very well. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like working for people, especially in Japan. Mm. Um, I you, you know people get promoted in Japan by seniority age mm -hmm. so you have a lot of idiots above you telling you what to do <laughs> and i just couldn't hack that so i thought geez I, you know i can't do this for the next 20 years so yes my my main motivation for doing it was to be my own boss and to manage my own time i think you know time is the number one thing if you can manage your own schedule and manage your own time uh that's that's more important than money in a way time to be honest especially as you get older you realize that time mm. is more Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit. So you, you start your company, you have your motivation and uh, how, where does, you know, where do you get 
the money from? Do you do you think starting a company you need a lot of money at the beginning? How how do you manage that? That's that's sometimes for people starting business they they seem to think they need a lot of funding and yeah. behind them. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, first advice is don't do it the way I did it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, actually, when I came from the UK, uh, I had racked up a lot of credit card debt in the UK um, with personal marriage reasons and mm. one thing and another and uh, lost money on property because there was a crash. And I came with a lot of debt, cut long story short, um, a lot of debt. And so when I started my business, I started probably with about, I don't know, like 15,000 pounds debt. Um, and it took me the first three years to pay off my debt before I even started making any profit. Wow. But, but I, didn't, I, I, I didn't have kids at that time and I didn't have a wife. So it, it was in, in that transitional period. So for me, there was no risk. It didn't matter if I, if I succeeded or failed. There I felt, therefore I felt no pressure and um, that was so. If you, when people say, "Oh, you, you took a big risk to leave a, a solid job in the UK, um, come to here," and then I worked as a rugby coach, but that was you know never going to be my long term career. And then to, to start a business with a fifteen thousand pound debt in the UK and spend three years paying off, I never looked at it like that. I just thought, mm. well, that's just the way it is. You know, I don't have kids, I don't have a wife. To me, it's no risk. I'll. I'll uh, I'll, I'll start it off and I'll do that. But of course, the, the ideal way to do it would be to have some funding in place <laughs> before mm. you start, before you open your business. But my the key point there, I guess, is that if I was able to do it, so you don't, it proves the point that you don't have to have funding in place. It just makes it easier if you have funding in place. But if you don't know what you're doing with that funding, you can burn through that money and waste it and be back mm. to square one again anyway. Mm -mm. the way i did it i could not make a mistake i had to get it right because it was sink or swim so sometimes when you you challenge yourself and put yourself under pressure you bring out the best in yourself wow and uh so yeah i mean that's that's a quite amazing story that for people who maybe think oh i don't have the money that you were you know minus fifteen thousand to begin with did did you find that um the, you know, you, you'd say you'd, you'd come from the UK and you had to, you know, this, this amount of debt, but obviously the, uh, the attitude to debt in, in Japan is very different, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. But of course, nobody knew I had 15,000 mm pounds. -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I was just living sort of hand to mouth and uh, make, making things work. Um, I think my, my girlfriend bought me my first computer as a present because <laughs> I did a computer for the office. Um, and I lived I lived upstairs in this juku, and I had one classroom. And on the left of it, the, it, the door led into like a diner kitchen mm -hmm. and, a, and a tiny shower. And on the other side of it led into a, a tiny tatami room bedroom. And that was my first school. Um, and then if you look at that school a few years later, all the, all the rooms have been knocked into classrooms. Mm. Uh, and I had moved out to another apartment. So we just ex expanded very slowly, room by room, until mm. the second floor was then a school and I had to move out to another apartment. Um, so it was just a step-by-step -step process, you know, not, not, not trying to run be before you can walk. I mean, there's, there's two ways of doing it. Like some people come to Japan and um, they come with money, they come with funding, and they are business people and they have uh, an objective of, they know before they come, they're going to create an English school business um, mm -hmm. and they're going to roll it out and they know exactly what they're doing, what they're going to go. But most of us, to be honest, don't have the luxury of doing that. So we have to claw our way from point zero uh, up, 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 through, up through the industry, you know, developing your business as you go along. Mm -hmm. That's how most of us in reality have to do it. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you had a background, obviously, you, you know, uh, knowing you, Ian, you're, um, you're quite outgoing guy and you have a background in coaching and, you know, dealing with people. But, you know, there may be some people out there that think of starting a school or uh, other, on, you know, other enterprise in, in ELT. And maybe they're not so outgoing and maybe a little bit more introverted. Uh, what, 
what advice i mean you're you have background of dealing with all all kind of personalities on on the rugby field rugby pitch rugby field um so i mean what advice would you give to people who are maybe you know a little bit shyer or you know come maybe for more from academic kind of background uh, can you yeah yeah mm. uh, well you know if you're going to start your own business you have to be a certain kind of person mm. so it's not for everyone mm. so i wouldn't say to everyone if, if, if you have a a big fear of risk and failure if you are not particularly innovative or creative thinking, if you would just rather earn a monthly salary and work in a, you know, in a, in a Kaiwa school or a, a, a public school in, in, in Japan, that might be the best way for you to go. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. That's mm -hmm. what some people want to do. But if you want to take the step and open a business, then you do have to have a certain mindset, which is number one, you have to have self-confidence. You have to believe that you can do it. Because if you believe you, you, you can't do it, then you won't do it. You'll fail. Mm -hmm. You have to believe you can do it. You have to have uh, a brain that that is innovative and creative um, to a certain extent. Um, and you have to take responsibility for the actions that you take, mm -hmm. um, be them good or bad. And, um, and, and when you take risk, it has to be calculated risk, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody has a fear of risk. Nobody doesn't fear failure. We all mm -hmm. do. But if it's calculated and logical, then normally you can you can uh, reassure yourself that that things will be okay so i think those qualities are really important for someone who's going going to open a business and um and perseverance perseverance is probably the most successful uh, sorry the the most important word in success mm -hmm. because if you if you develop something that's that's um that's of sound quality um then if you persevere with it over a number of years, it eventually will be successful. Mm -hmm. But m many people give up too soon. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Three foot from gold. You know? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, so um, just touch, we touched a little bit on, on entrepreneurship uh, there, Ian. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to kind of dig down a little bit more about the everyday running of a business. So, you know, how many students you need to break even. Uh, you know, how much you think you should uh, spend on advertising, how you should, maybe I'm asking too many questions here, but um, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. So tell me about the day-to-day -day difficulties you had when you were, when you were starting out, uh, let's say in accounts, getting students. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing, the point I would make is that you are only as good as the people that you have around you. And that's the same in rugby as well. Um, mm -hmm. I was also a um, an, an international uh, level surfing coach as well and it's the same thing whether it's whether you're coaching a surfing team a rugby team or a business team you're only as good as the people you have around you so I, I really strongly suggest people that they put a good team in place um, mm -hmm. that's the first thing partnerships well <laughs> partnerships in my experience normally end in tears oh. so yeah I I'm not a big I'm not a big one on partnerships because I see very few that succeed. Collaborations are good. Ah. Now, the difference between a pro partnership and a collaboration is a collaboration is you can you can break it anytime and get divorced and go your own way, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But contractual partnerships normally end in tears and end up in with misery for everyone. Mm -hmm. I found. So initially, I was lucky because. Um, I, I had I had a good half a good team around me who already existed in the Juku below where I started my school. We had a, a lady there who was very good at marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we had trial lessons, she was very good at talking to the mothers and um, getting the kids to sign up and getting money out of their pockets. So to have a person who who uh, who knows uh, how Japanese people think from a marketing mm -hmm. viewpoint is very important mm -hmm. you don't. and most of us foreigners don't so mm -hmm. you don't need a Japanese person who is very good at doing that and it's very hard to find those people because most Japanese people don't like picking up the phone and calling people and mm -hmm. chasing people down you know what it's like sure They'd rather send an email or wait for the person to reply and you need to someone in your business who's going to be a bit 
um, proactive mm. and uh, uh, aggressive in a nice kind of way, uh, business mm. wise aggressive, to go out and get those students. Um, also, I the teachers you employ are super, super important. If you em employ bad teachers, you have a bad school. And that's bottom line. And that's always been the most in, one of the most important things in my school. I've managed to retain my good teachers for, for quite a few years. We've had some teachers been with us almost 10 years, other teachers four, wow. five, six years, you know. Um, so that has been a, um, a big point as to why my business has continued to be, be sustainable and mm -hmm. uh, successful, because now we're in, how many years we're in? I think uh, 16, 17 years wow. now, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, so, you know, most businesses, you know, nine out of 10 businesses fail, fail out after 10 years, or was it five years? And the rest after 10 years. So mm. still be going at, at 17 years and have grown. I feel that's, uh, um, that's been quite successful. And, a lot of that has been down to the staff that I've employed and managed to keep. Um, and when I've had to replace them, I replace them with good teachers. So that that's one thing I would stress is surround yourself with good people. And I always use that adage, you know, if you're the smartest person in your business, you have a problem. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. So su surround yourself with smart people who can help you get to where you want to go. And especially if you're a foreign owner, you need smart Japanese people around you as well. Mm -hmm. Because you, it, it's, it's, we, there's this cultural difference where we just don't get it, right? We don't understand what they're thinking and they don't understand what, what, they're, what we are thinking. And there's nothing, nothing straight, um, not saying anything bad about that. It's just a cultural difference between mm. us, you know? And yep. you need good Japanese people to help you get into the minds of the Japanese customer quite often. Mm. So you touched on something really interesting there, uh, Ian, and this is a, a problem may, uh, that some business owners may have or some people I I who are thinking about starting a school or an enterprise in, in the future uh, may, may have is, uh, uh, what do you look for, for when you're hiring new teachers and how do you retain existing teachers? So you're, you've obviously been successful. So can you? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, well, but I, I look for three qualities, personality, honesty, and reliability. Mm -hmm. And I used to be of the mind, well, if, you know, if they're an experienced teacher, if they're a licensed teacher, that's going to be better, better, better. But I found that's not necessarily the case because, um, People who, I, I was myself, I came here as a licensed, you know, an experienced high school teacher from the UK of 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the way I try to teach here didn't work. It's just like, it's a completely different scenario. So I like to get people with a good personality, people who are honest and who are reliable. That's a really important quality, reliability. And then I can mold them into the way that I want them to be Mm -hmm. and the way that I want them to teach in my school. So we have a set pattern as to how I want them to teach a system, but there's flexibility within that system where they can inject their own personality into the classroom lesson. And then once they're, they're teaching the way that you want them to teach and they're turning up for classes on time because they're reliable, they're, they're honest, so you can you can rely on them, you know, to... Um, if there's money lying around, they're not going to take it. And mm. they have a good personality, so everyone likes them. Mm -hmm. um, that those are three really important things. Because a lot of a lot of mothers, when they bring kids or even adults when they come to a school, they join a school because they like the teacher. Mm. Right? Of course, they read the website, they read all the academic um, bump. But if they like the teacher, they're going to join and they're mm. going to stay. It's it's a quite low level way of thinking, isn't it? But it's true. It's true, you know. So. Teachers, are, um, having good teachers is really important. And then keeping mm -hmm. them, well, you just, you know, you, you treat them as you want to be treated. So I, I respect my teachers, create a professional but friendly environment with the school, look after them, um, communicate with them, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, give, give them what they want as much as you can to keep them happy um, while keeping the system running smoothly. 
So just, yeah, you've got to treat them well. And a lot mm. of, again, I, I, I don't want to be too critical, but I, I can say what I want, can't I? I mean, a lot of Japanese companies don't treat people well, mm. you know? And uh, if you treat people well, they'll work hard for you because they're not driven. They're not necessarily, good people are not necessarily driven by money. They're driven by um, feeling valued, mm. feeling wanted is far more important than, than just giving them extra money. That's not going to make them work harder. Mm. Creating a, a, a culture within your school that is in, in rich, rich in in um, in friendliness and and positivity and mm. professionalism and praise is far more important than just giving them more money. Here's here's another here's another way of looking at it. What's uh, what's a good marketing tip? Hire a good teacher. Yeah. Mm. As I said, you're only as good as the teachers you got in your school. You know, mm. so. Even if you're the best teacher and your teachers are not good, then you're not going to have a good school. You got to get got to get good teachers. And it, and and if I, Philip, to be honest with you, if you ask every school owner, the hmm. biggest headache all of us have is staffing. Hmm. I've been really lucky, as I just mentioned to you. I always had good. I had two bad teachers in my whole in in uh, all the time I've been doing it so far in in almost twenty years. Two bad teachers, um, but. I got rid of them really quickly because <laughs> I realized within two weeks they were not who I thought they were mm. um, and boom, they were gone. Mm. I, I, uh, I picked up the phone to my sister in the UK on one occasion. She just retired. She's a same as me, high school physical education teacher in the UK. I said, you just retired Karen, haven't you? I said, yeah, I just fired my teacher. She was crap. Get on the plane and come over. <laughs> so, <laughs> she did. She stayed here six months until I found another good teacher. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, hire slowly and fire quick. Mm. And, and tell me, for, for, for people who want to learn from, you know, the experience of others, tell me, what are some red flags you would see if, you, if you're going to interview a teacher? What, you know, in, let's say, mannerism, in, in, in what they say... What doesn't sound right? What, what do you think could cause problems down the line? How would you know that? Well, firstly is um, initial appearance, mm. the, way the way that they show up, um, their, initial, uh, their initial body language and um, verbal language to me. And then mm. things like overconfidence. Ah. Um, overconfidence. Uh, I've had a few teachers like that. And, you know, they just think they're so much better than they are mm. that relates to problems um people who don't listen people who don't listen and then people who become lone cowboys and they just want to go and teach lessons the way that they want to teach them because that's the way they've always taught them and i'm going to do it my way you don't need people like that and for me you know it's just it's a gut feeling i i can be with somebody uh for a short period of time and think this pe this person is is right or this person is wrong mm. um, so yeah, overconfidence, you know, don't listen, want to be a lone ranger, go out and do it their own way. Those are big red flags for me. And you know, Philip, one of the things I found is Skype interviews, online interviews. Oh my God. I mean, I thought I had a good gut feeling, but I, I have got it wrong twice. And they were both Skype interviews. Mm. Those people managed to convince me that they were someone they weren't. Mm. And my sister, because I got her on the call as well, because I because I said she's an experienced teacher. I mm -hmm. said, come in and come in and give me give me your opinion on that. We both got it wrong. We both uh -huh. got it wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, geez, you know, I mean, it's so hard online to know who the person really is. Mm. So be careful if you're out there and you're interviewing online, because it's really difficult. Mm. So face to face is so much better. But now we're in a we're in a time where it's very difficult, isn't it? To Exactly. Yeah, that's that that is a problem. I mean, I mean, that being the case, um, and, you know, you've given me some of your experiences online. Is there any tips you can give to online interviewing? Is there anything you learned considering the. Uh, yeah, well, what, what I, do, I mm. obviously I don't only have one interview. I have a series of interviews and I slowly. Uh, um, well, even from even from. Um, uh, Obviously, obviously, interview one is a little bit formal because you don't know each other. But I, I, I gradually get them to let their guard down and make them feel very comfortable 
and then the real person comes out usually <laughs> that's what mm. i've learned mm. you know throw them throw them a bit of rope and see how far they'll take it mm. um and those and then you can you can see a lot deeper as to what what they really like on the inside what the real person is if you throw them a bit of rope let them let their barriers down allow them to relax um and uh yeah, that's that's all I can advise. Really, it's tough. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. uh, but if they turn up and they're not good, get rid of them quickly. <laughs> and Ian, uh, turning to to your business, how many schools have you got now? Or tell me a little bit more about that. At the moment, I have three. I had mm-hmm. I had five at one time. Oh. Um, so, but I've got three. That's another. That's a sort of a little story on its own. Really, a business story. Um, so at the moment I've got my main school, um, I've got a, a smaller kids school in a, in a city about 30 minutes away. And then I've got a new active English school where we teach English through human movement, mm-hmm. which is, um, includes a, a complex of two gymnasia and classrooms, office and a rehabilitation room. And there's another lady that does her rehabilitation, um, Lomi Lomi massage out of, out of our building. So we get money from that as well. Um, so that's my new baby is the active English school. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's quite an interesting, uh, project that I've started. I've been pioneering active English. So to go back to stay on your question, three, three schools at the moment, I had two others. Um, but from a business point of view, this is important for people to realize when a school becomes, um, unsustainable, don't, don't flog it to death. You've got to know when to pull the plug on it. Mm. and my first the first school I sort of I sort of inherited it from somebody and it it was in an area where the the um, population was dropping the young kids were growing up and moving away so you look at the um, the demographics and you think this is this Mm. is never gonna work pull the plug on it so that one went Mm. then Nova crashed remember Nova Uh, I do Mm -hmm. yeah and somebody came to me and said look we got like 50 odd students from Nova, will you open a school? Because Nova's closed. Um, will you open a school near, near Nova? And one of the rich ladies said, my husband has an office building and this is, uh, the fourth floor is free. You can have it free of charge. Wow. So I said, yeah, let's do it. So we opened a, a school there, which ran for about two years and uh, mainly full of rich housewives. And eventually they started to drift away and the, 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 the woman who owned the building was saying, well, we've got to keep it going. It's the Japanese way. You cannot quit. You, well, I said, well, we're mm. losing money. We're losing money. Mm. <laughs> got to keep it going. You cannot shut it down. So I said, stuff that. End of mm. next month, I'm out of here. And I made sure that all the students had somewhere else to go. I set them up with other teachers or other schools so I didn't leave them high and dry and pulled the plug on that and walked away from that one. So I'm down to three now, but they're all... They're all sustainable. They're all healthy. You know, they don't make me super rich, Philip, to be honest. Mm. But uh, they they put food on the table for my family. It's a it's it's a comfortable living. I'm not going to get super rich from doing this. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, but but I'm happy, you know. So when I've got time, I can go surfing when I want. Um, I've got good staff who will run the lessons for me while I'm in the water surfing. Mm-hmm. And, and I, as I first said, time is more important than money. You know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, three schools uh, at the moment. And you touched on something really interesting there, which was how to cut your losses. I mean, you, you, whether it's a, a sunk cost fallacy or, you know, sometimes we're we're in a situation. Should we? Are, we're 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 stuck. We think, uh, you know, should I quit now? Should I cut cut my losses? Am I giving up? Um, as you mentioned earlier, am I three feet from gold? Or so. Ha- it, for you, it, it sounds like you made that dec- decision quite easily because, you know, you were losing money and that's it and you cut your losses. Yeah, it's but, not only that. Yeah. Mm. You're losing money, but you look at you look at the whole business picture. And mm. say, well, I could change this or I could change that, but is it going to have, is it going to, uh, the end? is the end result going to be much different? And you come to a conclusion that it isn't. So therefore, despite what anyone says around you, you pull the plug on it and you get away and that's not a failure that's just a good business decision because mm, then you it you might just look at it as a pivot you go somewhere else mm. you go to a new location where there where there's there, there, there's a new danchi you know housing estate with lots of young families with young kids and you you start a new school 
That's mm. just a good business decision. Mm, mm. But it depends how you look at failure, doesn't it? Because Japanese look at failure just the way you said, or oh, you're running away, you're, you failed. Mm. No, I didn't. Exactly. I just made a yeah. good business decision. Mm. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that you can't have English lessons with me anymore, but you can come to my new school if you want. <laughs> mm. <laughs> And, and tell me a little bit about the students you have at the moment. I mean, how does it break down? Do you have like, uh, what we say, kids, uh, business people, general English, uh, exam preparation? What's, uh, what's your main focus? Yeah, our strategy is to focus on, um, on, on kids. We have, we have uh, a strong cohort of kids in our schools. Um, and... The adult side of it, we we do focus our our strategy there is to focus on high end business professionals. Mm -hmm. So man to man, one to one lessons combined with online lessons for busy people. I have this proprietary um, um, lesson analysis software system that actually I brought from rugby. I told you I was. Um, mm -hmm. I was an analyst in rugby. Uh, I used to do a lot of the analysis for rugby. And uh, we had this online system where you analyze live what's going on in the rugby field. Well, I woke up one day and thought, hey, I can use that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I've adapted the, the, the analysis software. So if I was talking to you on, on a Zoom call, every time you make a mistake, I'm using my keyboard to analyze and create 14 second video clip highlights of mistakes that you make um, or good points that you make. And at the end of the lesson, I will send you a, uh, I will condense a 50, a 50 minute lesson down into a three to more, three to four minute um, highlight video for you that you can review with on screen captions, feeding back on all your mistakes and your good points. So now, Business, busy business people kind of like that because like the Shachos, the doctors, they're busy people and they don't mm. want time to drive across town to come to your school. So they say, okay, I can't come today. And uh, is it okay if I jump online? Yeah, sure. Just jump mm. online. We'll do the lesson online. So that's our sort of focus on the adults is high end business professionals for the other reason is that they never complain about paying the lesson fee right mm. because they're professionals and they know if they want a quality product they have to pay for it mm -hmm. whereas cheap people always complain about paying a cheap orgasm you know mm, mm, really mm. cheap and you want it even cheaper so that's why um plus this area here again it's a business decision we are very close to the uni uh, mia university hospital which has a lot of medical professionals living in the area so mm -hmm. it's a logical business decision to target those so we, we focus on those two areas, kids and high-end business professionals. And retaining students. Yeah, retaining students, um, vitally, vitally important. Um, and again, a lot of that comes down to your office staff. It mm -hmm. means that your office staff must be having continual good communication with the mothers um, and uh, good marketing about uh, you know what, what new courses we're introducing, what's coming up next year, um, how your kids are going to benefit from that. So you're always communicating with the mothers about the importance of staying in the system for the kids' education. And the other thing we do is most mothers never know what goes on in a classroom. So using this analysis system that I have, um, we take the camera, the video camera, into the classroom and once or twice a month, we make a one minute or less than one minute video of what's going on in the classroom. And on my system, we upload it to the mothers who are all on the system. And then they can they can see also their kid in the classroom speaking English. Um, they can see them progressing year after year. So that's good feedback. Mm -hmm. And it helps to keep them in the loop as to what's going on. So our, our kids' uh, retention rate is probably about 90%, I Whoa. think. Yeah, I mean, mm. you, you get you get your open end says the, the grade sixes um, uh, in from elementary school, they, they graduate when they go to junior high school. We try and keep as many of those as we can into junior high school classes. But most of our the students we lose are our grade five and six students who whose mothers. There's this thing in Japan where mothers think when they get to five and six, 
they've got to go off to Juku to study for the, the Jukain test, the entry mm. test for the school. And so if you're going to lose them, you normally lose them in five or six, the kids. Mm. So we try and keep them, but most of our losses are from, from that age group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we manage to, we manage to um, keep them. Mm -hmm. a lot and, and that goes back to all the things i've said it comes back to good communication from my office staff having good teachers that the kids like running a professional system where the figurehead me is seen as being professional and he's an ex you know ex from the uk ex professional licensed teacher it all gives credibility mm. to what you do mm. um, so you build up trust over a period of years and then uh, people stay with you and tips on dealing with parents in yeah, <laughs> I'm not the most <laughs> diplomatic, actually. <laughs> but uh, um, again, a lot of that I leave to my Japanese office staff, um, and uh, they're very good at it. Mm. Um, if we get difficult, you know, if we get monster mothers, I just come in and I tell them straight whatever I need to tell them, and I don't mm. care. I don't mm. know what they think I don't care if they, I know I'm right. So, I believe I'm right. It's my mm. opinion. It's my school, so I'll run it the way I want. And if you don't want to be here, you can go somewhere else. So I mm. just, I just tell them straight, to be honest. Um, but that's only at the last resort. I try and leave it to my staff to be uh, more diplomatic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And tell me a little bit about you. You touched on um, tracking progress. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about that. You, you, you mentioned videos. Uh, how? How can you know students measure the progress? Because that's that's very important, isn't it, for retaining and students? It is, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, we well, we we three ways. We use video analysis, as I said, so mm -hmm. we provide regular feedback to the mothers via video. Also, um, I, I I do it old school in a way. They do mm -hmm. hand uh, the teachers do uh, once a term hand handwritten reports um, with a. Uh, with the uh, the spider graph, you know, um, linked with the spider graph, just showing feedback from the mothers in all, all aspects of what they've been studying in language. And, um, and of course, we do the uh, Aiken Junior test. Um, so all kids are submitted for the Jido Aiken, Aiken Junior test. Um, so mothers, you see that they, they see their kids progressing through bronze, silver, gold every year. So they see the progression, they get regular um termly reports and they get video feedback mm. so, you know it's strange a lot of mothers are very interested in their kids other education and a lot of other mothers couldn't couldn't care less as long as, oh my kid goes to a kaiwa school that's okay mm. you know you get a lot of that um, mm. so i we have to assume as school owners that all mothers and parents are are interested in what their kids are learning but to, to be honest, a lot aren't. As long mm. as they're at the school, mm. it's it's quite sad, really. But um, mm. but as a professional school, you assume that they are all interested, and you and you give quality feedback. Mm. So it's very important to set expectations or or no expectations. Well, to set expectations, um, yeah, you know, every kid every kid is different, aren't they? Mm. So it's the, in a way, the the Aiken Junior test sort of is their target. They want to get from mm. bronze to silver to gold to the Aiken to the next level. Um, so th that, in a way, is 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 your goal. That that's the expectations. That's what we show the mothers in the trial lessons. In the you know this this is the process they're going to go through. This is where they'll start, and this is where they'll end up. And we can show them video of them progressing um, mm -hmm. you know every every year so there's nothing more important than actually seeing your kid going from not being able to speak to be able to speak you know? mm. so, and a lot, the, a lot of the kids won't speak when they go home mm. um, so the mothers don't know that the kids can speak english because they won't speak in their house so you have to find a way of g getting them to speak in front of the mothers so that the mothers know that they can speak Mm -hmm. so you have to stage that sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. And mo moving on a little bit to, let's say, more current events and uh, COVID and online teaching. You know, in the past, in Japan, I think there was 
the, the uptake of online teaching, you know, it, it wasn't so popular, maybe lagging behind other, other countries in, in popularity. But of course, COVID has forced us all to relook re uh, our way of working and, and living. Um, so how, how has it changed for you? Have you seen much migration to online teaching or? Well, mm. no, because mm. again, this is a, a big business point is that I'm in Mie Ken, which is people call country, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're right near, we're in Sioux City, we're 40 minutes from Nagoya. So it, it's not what I call country, but it's not, a, it's not like where you live in, in Tokyo or mm. in a city like Osaka. So there's a big difference between doing business, this business, Eikaiwa, in a big city and doing it in the countryside. Mm -hmm. and what, COVID related, we haven't been affected that much initially we were shut down for uh, uh, three weeks was it a month or so back april last year but since then we haven't been affected much mm -hmm. we i mean i'm set up for video as you know we tried doing video lessons but do you know to be honest they weren't very successful if i if i'm honest um not many kids joined them um at first, it was a steep learning curve to get the teachers set up to try and teach online um, for the kids, yeah? Adults, no problem. They just switch online. Adults are easy. But um, for the kids, it was a bit, of a, a bit of a steep learning curve, a bit of a nightmare. It didn't work very well, to be honest. And luckily, we only had to do it for a few weeks. And since then, I've escaped most of it, and we've been running normal class classes, uh, classroom classes ever since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit. Um, so I didn't, I didn't actually ask you about your name, name of your school URL. If you could uh, please go through that for me. I know you, Queen's English, isn't it? Is yeah. Well, I, yeah. Uh, the the um, the actual we're we're a, a, a limited company in Japan, mm -hmm. so um, Kabushi Geisha. So we are the the limited company name is Queen's Education Limited, mm -hmm. but um, uh, we trade as Queen's English School. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also uh, active English. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, so the URL, the active one is uh, activeenglishnow.com. And the other one is that my, ma my main school is queens-e.net. Uh, yeah, so people okay. can find, find us there. Yeah. And what are your plans for the future? Where do you see your business going? Are you happy enough with three schools? Will you go back to five? Will you, what's... Uh... Yeah, What's your medium-term, long-term plan? Well, my active English school, um, we're, we're looking at um, expansion there because I, I'm pioneering active English in Japan. I see that as really important. Um, so we, the active English school, we're working currently working in collaboration with um, uh, Maple, Link, Maple Leaf Publishing, Kenny King. I mean, mm -hmm. you might know Kenny. So we're, we're setting up a, a course um, currently producing it of a uh, one-year course of 48 active English lessons using Maple Leaf um, music resources, uh, a lot of their, their lesson ideas combined with our, our active English drills. So there'll be a video package, there'll be all a resource package that people can buy, a, a turnkey course ready to go for people who want to do active English um, in their schools, either as a main course or as part of their uh, normal lessons. So that's a whole whole another podcast to talk about that. But that side of my business, yes, driving it forward, looking to expand it. My other two schools, which are standard Akiwa schools, you know, Philip, I get to a point, we get to a point I find in business where when you have like 200 plus students and you have two or three schools, there's a tipping point, right? And mm. you think, if I go bigger everything mm. goes bigger mm. overheads go bigger mm -hmm. there's more you need more staffing you need more funding you need more buildings and that creates a lot of problems in it in itself mm -hmm. so you get to a point when you get to that tipping point you have to decide do i go to the next step or am i happy with my lot and me i've got i'm happy i've decided basically i'm happy with my lot i've got two good solid English schools with good staff and the active English school that I'm driving forward and I'm happy with that so I, I don't want educationally I don't want to go any bigger than that because you get into a whole new realm of business and implications 
So unless you're ready to dive into that deep pool, <laughs> um, be happy with your lot, you know, that's me. Okay. Well, I think that's a good a good place to end it today. Um, our very first podcast, and um, I was delighted to uh, interview Ian Simpson. And I, I hope you've got some good tips from Ian, some, some things that will work in your business. Um, and Ian, what's a good way to contact you? I mean, do you, what's uh, your yeah. online, I presume, like all the usual Twitter and Yeah, I'm on, yeah. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Facebook or people can contact you, uh, contact me via you or by, by, by my private email, which is Ian at Mark at Queens dash E dot net. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm willing to give advice to anyone, help anyone who's starting out because I don't know all the answers, but I made a lot of mistakes so I can help people not to make the same mistakes as me. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm willing to help. I'd love to help if anyone needs it. And Great if anyone that. wants to help me, could please contact me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, so yeah, so we'll put all those in the show notes and thank you everybody for tuning in and see you next time on the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out eflmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.